Welcome everyone to day three of the Just Transition platform meeting, uh, the Coal Regions in Transition Virtual Week. Um, today we're going to be discussing research projects on environmental issues related to mining and coal mine closure. So thank you all for joining us today for this exciting session. Um, I'm Zoe Rasbash, a representative from the Platform Secretariat, and I work for Climate Strategies, which is a member of the consortium operating that secretariat, along with um, three other organisations. Um, I'm seeing people still coming in, so yeah, welcome. Thanks, everyone. Um, so as I was saying, we're well into the swing of coal, trans coal regions in transition virtual week. Um, there's more webinars and workshops to come. And um, as somebody who was very involved in the youth movement, I think there's a very exciting session tomorrow on youth involvement in the transition, which I highly recommend everyone check out. But today, um, today is very exciting. We're bringing together representatives from different research projects to present insights concerning environmental rehabilitation around coal mine closures. Um, updating us on findings to guide appropriate financially feasible actions when considering land rehabilitation, ecological restoration in the circular economy. Um, three research projects will present their work and provide uh, insight on the research state of play of coal mine closure. So we're really excited to hear from them today. Um, so maybe what I'll start with is a quick uh, run through of the agenda of the session. So um, I'll start off by giving a short introduction into the into the platform's research um, uh, to the platform's work here um, around uh, environmental issues related to mining and coal mine closure and what we've been doing in the past few years. Um, I will then, uh, we will then pass to Lucas Jansen, who will provide a commission perspective and a scene setting presentation uh, to contextualise our other speakers. Um, Lucas joined DGRTD as a national expert on agriculture in 2006 and in 2015 joined the RFCS unit in DGRTD and dealt with all aspects of that program, project management, but also as secretary of the Coal Advisory Group and the Coal and Steel Committee, in which member states are represented. Mr. Jansen was involved in most activities of the Coal Region in Transition Initiative from the beginning. Um, and very excited to hear from him. Um, as he will provide an overview of the upcoming budgeting period of life and updates on the research fund for coal and steel, along with some insights um, on work to line up coal mine transitions with the Green Deal. So that'll be a very interesting presentation. And then we'll hear from our three panelists um, from three exciting research projects. So Pedro from the University of Oviedo uh, on the Merida project. Um, the Merida project has been working to develop a methodology to manage uh, environmental impacts and risks of any coal mine closure, along with a best practice manual for industry and policymakers to assess short and long term environmental risks and consequences while defining mitigation measures to take forward. So very looking, we're looking forward to hearing from Pedro and then Alicia, um, a researcher at the Central Mining Institute and on the recovery project will be speaking. Um, and the recovery project has a focus on developing an actionable framework for land rehabilitation and ecological transformation of coal mining affected areas and kind of is working to accelerate the recovery of degraded and transformed ecosystems into a good ecosystem status. So that'll provide a really interesting perspective. And then lastly, I'll pass to Demetrius, who is the Senior Scientific Coordinator at TU Delft and Executive Coordinator at the Water Mining from Life Brine Project, which works to demonstrate an advanced technique for eliminating coal mine wastewater brines um, combined with resource recovery. So it'd be really interesting to get that circular economy perspective. So that's gonna be um, a really interesting panel. And then we'll kind of close the session um, for 50 minutes for questions at the end. Um, and now I'll just do a little bit of uh, housekeeping. Um, as you can see on the slide here, uh, we will run for an hour and a half and please send in questions using Slido. So in this session, we'll be using Slido for the Q&A. If you can just um, go to slido.com and then just enter the code CRIT5, um, you can submit your questions at the end and it'd be great to hear from everyone. So please do um, submit your questions and vote on other questions so that we know which ones we should answer and which ones are the ones that people are concerned about. Uh, um, and if you do have a question for a particular panelist, please put their uh, name um, in, in the question, so who it's directed to. Uh, and also just to say that the chat is open with the host in case of any technical issues. And lastly, the um, the webinar will be recorded and available to watch after the event. So um, thank you for uh, being patient with me on that little bit of a uh, housekeeping. So yeah, I'm Zoe um, from the Secretary of Initiative of Coal Regions in Transition. And I'm just going to do start things off with a few words um, on kind of what the platform has been doing these past few years on this subject. So the platform has been working on this subject with a focus on environmental rehabilitation and repurposing in our toolkits and a corresponding webinar in June, which is available on the DG Energy YouTube channel, if you would like to check that out. 
um, as well as physical meetings in Brussels last July and October. Um, we hosted a session called Coal Mine Closures, Companies and Authorities and Their Role in the Transition, where we presented a selection of case studies to explore what the institutional barriers in implementing rehabilitation measures were. And then last October, we held a session specifically on coal plant repurposing. And video streams of these sessions and reference documents that we publish um, after each platform meeting, if you would like some more information around these, can be found on the DG Energy website. Simply just type in DG Energy Coal Regions and you should be able to find it there. Um, so yeah, uh, that's just kind of what the platform has been doing on, on this area. And we're really excited to kind of take this forward with this session today. It's really exciting to hear uh, that we have a chance to hear from those who are kind of working on demystifying environmental issues around coal mine closures and who have been engaging in developing research for actionable outcomes, um, repurposing waste material, the circular economy. And just a kind of final thought that it's really, you know, essential that we address and have action plans for the environmental aspects of the coal transition, um, which address social is issues and also provide innovative solutions within a circular economy mode of thinking. So it's really great that everybody's here today to kind of discuss this. Um, I'm really excited to hear our speakers today. I think we're going to get a real well-rounded view um, and then hopefully open up at the end with some, some questions from you guys. So uh, without further ado, um, let me pass over to Lucas from uh, DGRTD for our commission perspective. Thank you. Lucas, you're on mute. Yes, okay, now you can hear me. Um, for the presentation, should I share it or? Uh... Oh yeah, here it is. Okay. Um, yes, as uh, I am representing the Research Fund for Coal and Steel, uh, we are at the moment in the moment uh, uh, trying to uh, update the program uh, as uh, several uh, problems came up the last uh, years. One of the problems was that uh, our money comes from uh, the interest on the fund and because of the very low interest rates at the moment, um, the return on the investments is uh, so low that we cannot finance yearly calls anymore. Maybe next uh, slide, please. Uh, um, so, uh, in, uh, but next to that, we also have to deal with the Green Deal <laughs> in the sense that uh, the EU has decided to uh, become one of the front runners uh, to um, develop uh, the, uh, how to call it, to address the uh, challenges uh, put on the, on the climate uh, agenda. And uh, therefore, uh, a revision of the regulations uh, is uh, foreseen. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, there are three um, uh, decisions that have to be changed. And because uh, it's uh, based as a, uh, our legal base is a, a separate treaty, uh, we need to uh, pass them through the Council, which makes a very long process. But the three uh, different uh, decisions have to do with first uh, uh, the fact that, uh, as I told you, there is too little uh, interest uh, generated at the moment. So we need to be able to also use uh, part of the fund, which is 1.6 billion euros, uh, in order to finance a yearly call of at least 40 million. But uh, next to that, we want to, um, to add to uh, some bigger uh, investments in the uh, uh, transition. And therefore, uh, we want to use also a larger amount of money for uh, breakthrough technologies or uh, in, the coal, uh, in the coal field on uh, uh, major research uh, for the just transition. So that's uh, 3.1 uh, uh, where we are talking about. Another thing is that we have to uh, amend the council decision to make them in line with the Green Deal. So in order to update and also take into account, of course, that uh, fossil fuels will be phased out and that we are of major, uh, that we have major challenges in the field of coal and steel, especially coal uh, for the transition. And then the third uh, decision that's uh, not done by DG RTD, but it's done by DG budget, and that has to do with the practical implementation, how to apply uh, the fin financial uh, impl uh, implications of, uh, of these decisions. Next uh, slide, please. <clears throat> 
So um, for the modernization pa package, there are four uh, uh, main objectives. That is first to ensure uh, financial annual allocation to manage RFCS call of proposals of at least 40 million uh, euros. Uh, when we started uh, with the fund uh, uh, in 2003, uh, there was still about 60 million, but uh, this has been gradually going down because of the uh, declining interest rates. But we uh, agreed internally that we need at least 40 million to have uh, a reasonable uh, call of proposals. Um, from those 40 millions, 27.2% uh, uh, goes to coal related projects, 72.8% uh, goes to steel related projects, which means that for coal is uh, about available about 11 million each year. Then, as I mentioned before, we also like to allocate additional resources for the next uh, multi-annual uh, framework pro uh, for the next uh, financial period from 2021 to 2027 to respond to new research ne uh, needs, especially in the field of transition. Um, so uh, another thing is to uh, modify the financial guidelines uh, by managing the assets of the uh, uh, of the research fund for coal and steel. Until now, we uh, we have the obligation to uh, invest in triple A uh, kinds of investments, but that also means that the return on the investment is very low. So we have decided to have a little bit more of um, uh, take a little bit more risk, which of course also can be more uh, negative effects. But we expect that we will be able to uh, have a higher uh, returns on the investments. <clears throat> and then last but not least is, of course, to update RFCS coal and steel research objectives to the uh, challenges put down in the European Green Deal. Next uh, slide. So what are the plans then uh, concretely? So as I mentioned before, we want to have at least 40 million a year for an annual coal uh, in RFCS. Uh, which is uh, uh, taking place every year, and this, this will continue in the coming years. But in the next uh, financial period, we also want to uh, make available about 71 million uh, euro for breakthrough clean steel projects and large coal projects, uh, which are in line with the just transition mechanism. Uh, which, if we split it up, will be about 19 million extra a year uh, for coal and 52 uh, million for breakthrough technologies in, uh, in clean steel uh, projects. This is also fully in line with the uh, present uh, uh, division between coal and steel, where 27.2% uh, of the uh, money uh, is allocated to coal and 72.8% is uh, attributed to steel-related uh, uh, projects. Next slide. So, if we now look to the new uh, proposed RFCS coal and research objectives, maybe I should uh, underline that we are still in the process of getting it accepted. It's on the moment in the Council, so all the Member States have to agree uh, uh, to this. And as soon as they have agreed, then the new system can start uh, uh, in, uh, with, uh, uh, with these kinds of amounts and uh, we can uh, continue um, uh, in this process. So for the coal uh, research objectives, uh, the new ones will be supporting the just transition of the coal uh, sector and regions, uh, improving health and safety, and minimizing the environmental impacts of coal mines in uh, transition. Um, this also uh, refers, by the way, not only coal mines, but also uh, of coal infrastructure like uh, power plants and so on that may uh, get other destinations. Next slide. <clears throat> so, um, this makes the bridge to the next two presentations. Uh, um, um, we have been addressing issues relating to the transition already in the past. Marida is a very good project, uh, uh, example of it, uh, that just has been finished. Uh, and Recovery is a running project that uh, now is being financed uh, by uh, the Commission and of, from which we have high expectations because we expect uh, the regions to profit from these kinds of projects. 
It's not knowledge that we want to keep for ourselves, it's knowledge that we want to share. And that's also why we participate in this, uh, in this uh, uh, online event. Next slide. Uh, and this is, uh, thank you. I would like to uh, give back the uh, word to the moderator. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Lucas. That was uh, that was great to hear from you, and you really shed some light on those processes. And I think that's a great frame for what we'll be discussing. Um, I just want to remind everyone uh, that you can submit questions through Slido. Um, so if you just go to to people who have joined, who maybe after my introduction, if you go to uh, Slido.com and enter in the code CRIT five, so that's C R I T five, you can then enter questions to ask our panelists, and we can. Uh, and you can vote on the questions as well. And it'd be really great to get as many questions as possible so we can answer um, anything that we don't cover in the presentations today. So that's just a reminder to go to slido.com and submit your questions. Um, I'm now going to pass over to uh, one of our first of our three research projects. I will um, pass over to Pedro from the Merida project. Um, thank thank you. you very much, Zoe. Thank you very much. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Pedro Riesgo. I am from the University of Oviedo in Spain. And today I have the pleasure to present the final outcomes of the Research Fund for Coal and Steel Merida project, entitled Management of Environmental Risks During and After Mine Closure. Next slide, please. First of all, a few words on Merida project partners. We were a group of 10 partners from six different European countries. Poland, Germany, UK, France, Czech Republic, and Spain, headed by the Central Mining Institute in Katowice, Poland. Among us were two industrial partners, UNOSA from Spain and Polska Grupa Gurnica from Poland. Next slide, please. The main goals achieved uh, by, the, by the project were the following ones. In the first place, providing a specific guidance on the issues that need to be considered when assessing the environmental impacts for, from underground coal mines at closure and post-closure stages. In the second place, identifying the physical and chemical processes that affect environmental risks and establishing modeling and monitoring methods that should be implemented. In the third place, developing an integrated risk assessment methodology followed by calculating the financial provisions required for closure and post-closure stages for each company. Finally, providing a practical methodology that can be used for the evaluation of risk, as well as for selecting the remediation measures in terms of their performance in risk reduction, practical implementation and cost. Uh, next slide, please. Now, I would like uh, to explain briefly the work undertaken in the project and its results. In the first place, a full description of the two European mining sites studied was achieved. Riduldobeana Mining Complex in Poland, as well as Mosquitera and Pumarabule Mines in Spain. In the second place, the gassing properties of coal samples under water pressures were analyzed in order to understand a phenomenon of the water impact on gas when flooding the mine. Next slide, please. In the third place, a reference guide on soil gas monitoring in coal mining regions was produced, giving guidance, warnings, and recommendations. Finally, among the preliminary results, a comprehensive report and analysis of coal mine closure risk criteria was produced. The main risk criteria are shown in the slide, subsidence, water quality, and air quality. Next slide, please. Now I would like to present the results of the model that were developed within the project. In the first place, suitable and validated model to properly describe the behavior of rock mass in the region of flooded coal mines was developed. The results allowed obtaining the distribution of the formation indicators on the ground surface and stresses. Next slide, please. In the second place, suitable and validated models were developed to properly describe groundwater flow and solute transport during the water rebound process, according to the specificity of the different sites. Next slide, please. In the third place, suitable and validated models were developed 
to evaluate quantitatively the surface water environmental impacts during coal mine closure and post closure periods. Next slide, please. Finally, suitable and validated models to assess the greenhouse gas emissions from closed mines with or without flooding to the surface were also prepared. Next slide, please. Now I would like to mention the WebGIS application, which was developed as a client framework for spatial data infrastructures and can be freely accessed at the link you can see on the screen. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide presents two examples of the West uh, WebGIS application. On the left, you find a contaminant plumes in Poland, and on the right, hydraulic head in Spain. Next slide, please. Relating risk assessment, four reports were produced on the risk identification, analysis, evaluation, and proposed treatment of areas exposed to the different risks uh, at the selected uh, mines of the project. Next slide, please. Also, forecasted environmental performance of the selected treatment options in terms of impact, impacts and risks at the selected mines were developed. Next slide, please. Cost analysis and financial provisions required for closure and post-closure for the selected mines were also developed. A detailed description of the different investment and costs needed for the different pollution treatments was presented. Next slide, please. Then we developed the sensitivity analysis of the calculations, followed by an uncertainty analysis based on the modeling of the variables to whom the net present value is more sensitive. Next slide, please. Finally, and in order to disseminate the results of the Merida project, we have produced a best practice guideline for the prediction of environmental impacts and the management of risks during underground coal mine closure and post closure. The best practice guideline can be freely accessed at the link you can see on the screen. Next slide, please. Now I would like to present uh, the conclusions from the project. Being the most important ones, the fact that after analyzing the risk, analy analyzing sorry, and modeling the risks, uh, risk, the risk, oh, sorry, risk treatment strategies were identified and evaluated in terms of performance and cost, and that a financial provision for each company was provided. Next slide, please. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Petra. That was a really interesting insight into your work. Um, yeah, that was a great presentation. And I just want to remind everyone we are running ahead of schedule, um, which means we'll have more time for questions. So please do head to stato.com and enter the code GRIP5 to uh, submit your questions and do vote on the ones that are already there so that we know that we're answering the, the most popular ones. Um, so now uh, I'll pass over to um, Alicia from the Recovery Project. Uh, please go ahead, Alicia. Thank you, Zoe. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Alicia Krzemień. I work for the Central Mining Institute in Poland, in South Poland, which is Silesia region. And this is my pleasure to give you a short uh, information on recovery research project, which deals with uh, degraded and transformed ecosystems. So I will talk. This is the four years long uh, project funded by Research Fund for Poland Steel. And we are now in the second year of its realization. Next slide, please. So uh, this is not the first slide, but okay, I can just start uh, from the middle. That's not a problem. So, so uh, previously, I wanted just to give you, could you just go back to the first slide, which was an uh, introduction to the project? And uh, then, well, doesn't matter. Anyway, so uh, I wanted just to tell you that we are uh, different, seven different partners uh, from uh, four different countries. And uh, in uh, this project, uh, we are doing work on recovery of degraded and transformed ecosystem in coal mining affected areas. Uh, and within this project, people from Spain, people from 
uh, Germany, people from Poland and people from Czech Republic are working. We have three different uh, industrial partners working on this project. Uh, and uh, we have six different sites um, that we are dealing with. First of all, the aim of our project. The aim of our project is uh, to focus on land rehabilitation and ecological restoration of coal and um, mining affected areas and aiming to accelerate the recovery of degraded and transformed ecosystem to a good ecosystem status. Uh, so, by mapping, by quantifying and evaluating the ecosystem services provision, we are trying to find the best solution. What is the problem? There is almost no information available on the environmental and social eco effectiveness and re re land rehabilitation and, of course, ecological restoration of coal mining affected areas. I'm just reminding you that our project is dealing with uh, underground coal mining and also with surface coal uh, mining. So here now on the slide, you can see the objectives of our project is, first of all, to give guidance for policy and decision makers in order to select the land rehabilitation and ecological restoration actions. Uh, which actions? The ones that deliver the greatest benefits relative to their costs and identifying optim optimal alternatives and devising suitable strategies. So we are trying to increase the impact of land rehabilitation and ecological restoration actions on both society and environment. Next slide, please. So, uh, second of all, we are trying to deliver addressing specifically coal mining affected areas. Uh, first of all, detailed cost of land rehabilitation and benefits in provision of ecosystem services. Second of all, suitable indicators uh, for the ecosystem services, the indicators that will allow us to validate uh, our uh, solutions. And finally, feasible valuation techniques that what I mentioned and optimal discount rates. And our ambition is to produce best practice guidelines, hopefully at the end of our four years long uh, project. Next slide, please. So how we want to tackle the environmental and social costs and benefits of restoration. So the first thing is that ecosystem services do add an important dimension to express the level of land rehabilitation and ecological restoration, which is very important from a social point of view. Uh, evaluation of ecosystem services provided by different land rehabilitation and ecological restoration scenarios must be undertaken, first of all, to assess their contribution to human well-being. We have to find the proper solution. Understand the incentives that individual decision makers face in managing ecosystems in a different ways. And finally, evaluate the consequences for alternative course of action, so the solutions we apply. Next slide, please. This is our methodology. Of course, I will not go into details. I just wanted to mention that now we are working on land rehabilitation and ecological restoration alternatives. So we are giving different scenarios that finally will quantify and, uh, and uh, decide about their cost of actions and as well as the economic value of ecosystem services. Our ambition is to, to get the land rehabilitation and ecological restoration options, which deliver the greatest benefit. I mean, the greatest benefit relative to their investment and maintenance cost. Next slide, please. So, the outcome. Uh, first of all, we will demonstrate approaches and best practices for analyzing land rehabilitation and ecological restoration actions. And please let me say that this is one of the first comprehensive attempts at the European level to uh, link the field of land rehabilitation and ecological restoration with ecosystem services concept in underground and open cast, which means surface uh, coal mining affected areas. Next slide, please. And finally, finishing my presentation, I would like to mention that we are working uh, in this project on specific solutions. One of them is artificial substitutes for soils in difficult terrains. Here in the slide, you can see a, a picture of a Yanina waste heap. This is a very big terrain, 80 hectares, and problems like air quality deterioration, biodiversity loss, surface and groundwater pollution, really uh, the terrain that really needs help, that I would say this way. Next slide, please. 
And uh, what we are doing now, we were testing uh, waste materials. I mean, waste materials like coal combustion byproducts, sludges, aggregates, and organic matters. We were mixing them in order to produce artificial soil substitutes and just using also rock waste from this uh, waste heap in order then to test them with different uh, species and to, to be able to, to use them within this waste heap I, I've showed you. Now, I would like you to enjoy the video that will show you the progress within our project and shortly present uh, the outcomes of our, uh, our project together with some different um, sites that we are analyzing in this project. Thank you very much for your attention. Hopefully you can see it. Zoe, please guide uh, our audience. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Yes, yeah, so we will now um, be watching the video from the recovery project. So it would be uh, for all of those um, joining us on WebEx on that platform, a multimedia viewer tab will pop up, pop up. Please press continue and then you should be able to watch the video. And for those joining us online, YouTube should pop, um, if you press continue, should pop up in another tab. Um, so if you just switch over to that tab, you can uh, watch the video. Um, uh, and it should pop up um, as a separate tab in the browser. So please everyone enjoy uh, the video. Okay, the video has just finished for me, but I'll give a 30 second uh, buffer period so that if anyone had a trouble kind of accessing the video, we can give them time to watch the rest. Okay, hopefully that's given everyone enough time to watch the video. And um, if not, hopefully you've seen where you can finish it on YouTube later. Um, 
so yeah, thank you, Alicia, for that for that presentation. It was um, uh, very interesting to get your perspective on all of this. And I will now um, pass over to uh, Dimitris from the Life Brian project. So over to you. Thanks, Zoe. Can you hear me first of all? Yeah. Brilliant. So good afternoon. Let me first uh, start by thanking Anna Sobchak for the kind invitation to take part in this extremely important event to the coal mine regions in transition and present the work that we have done together with our partner, the Central Mining Institute. I am Dimitris Xebionos, Managing Director of Silo, Innovation Manager of the Life Brain Mining Project. Now, in the next uh, slide, we all know that coal mines are closing fast and that the energy transition is already happening. But although the coal mines are closing, the wastewater problem remains. And let's see together why. Next slide, please. Now, the presentation is structured in three main parts. I will start by providing some information about the coal mines in Europe. Then I will present the problem of wastewater management, even for closed mines, by presenting a case study. And finally, I will introduce to you, to you how we are solving this problem with our EU project called Life by Mining and how do we contribute to the circular economy at the same time. Next slide, please. Here we have the latest map published from Euracol. As this audience, I suppose that is very well informed about the statistics, I will not present this slide in detail. I would like only to draw your attention on the fact that for hard coal, Europe is dependent on Poland, which supplies more than 80% of the total hard coal needs and thus delivers a great value to Europe. Now you may think that this value will soon not be needed. Next slide. From this diagram, we can see the different uses of different types of coal. Although the energy related uses on the left and the very right of this diagram will soon phase out, the metallurgical coking coal needs will remain. The economic importance of coking coal was also the reason that the European Commission characterized this as one of the 30 critical raw material as well. If you press a click, you will see that. As such, some hard coal mining activity will still remain inactive in uh, the years to come. Um, can you please press again? Click. Yeah, that was what I just said. That is about uh, the critical raw materials. One of the 30 is the coking coal. Please go to the next slide, please. Now, we, uh, if we have a closer look at Poland, you can see that hard coal reserves are located in the southern part of the country, with a vast majority being concentrated in only one region, Upper Silesian region or Slaskia in Polis. Next slide, please. Although Poland is delivering the high value to the whole Europe, as discussed in the previous slides, this comes at a high environmental cost at a local level. In Slaskia region, the wastewater effluents of the hard coal mine industry are discharged into the two largest rivers of the country, Odra and Vistula rivers, as you can see with blue. Next slide, please. A quantity as large as 182 million cubic meters, if you press again, click uh, Zoe, please, are discharged per year in these rivers. Here you can see a picture of the Oder River, and here in the next slide, a picture of Vistula River in front of the famous Wawel Royal Castle in Krakow. It has been reported that the salt discharges in these two rivers bring not only environmental damage, but also annual economic losses associated with losses in industry, agriculture, and water transport, which are estimated to be 100 to 25, uh, 50 million cubic meters, uh, million euros, sorry, per year. Next slide, please. Now, we have been uh, working together with the Polish Central Mining Institute in identifying today which are the active and abandoned mines in the Slaskia region. Here you can see you can have the most updated map on the hard coal mines of this region. Currently, there are 18 active coal mines in the region operated by five coal mine companies. You can see all the active mines in white and the abandoned in gray. Now, I will now uh, focus on a specific case study to illustrate how an abandoned mine can affect the operation of an active coal mine, presenting the well-known Debiesco case study, where Budrick and Debiesco coal mines are involved. Next slide, please. Passing now to the second part of my presentation. Next slide. Thanks. Debiesco is the first 
plan at a global level that applies a zero liquid discharge system to treat coal mine effluents, able also to recover salt of edible quality. Next slide, please. As you can see here, the plant receives approximately 4,000 cubic meters per day from the active Budic mine and approximately twice this quantity from the neighboring closed Debiensko mine. This is a very important point here. In order for Budric to continue operations, it was necessary within their operating license to dewater the neighboring closed mine to avoid flooding risks. As a result, although the Biensko is a closed mine, still dewatering is needed. Next slide, please. You can see here that the capital expenditure for the equipment is estimated around 60 million US dollars. And the main drawback is the high energy consumption estimated at 970 kilowatt hours per ton of salt recovered. Next slide, please. The contract to get this system installed was signed back in 1988, and it was only 1993 when the first salt crystals were produced. We are currently co collecting further technical information, and we will organize a site visit there in approximately October 2021, as you can see below at the bottom, combined with a stakeholder consultation event. If you are interested to join, do get in contact with me. Next slide, please. Now, passing to the final part of my presentation, I'm going to present to you how we're advancing the state of the art, discussed also within the Debiensko case study, promoting at the same time circular economy. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yes, this one. Our project has been funded by the LIFE program, the funding tool of the European Commission for the Environment. The project has nine partners from three EU countries, Poland, Greece, and the Netherlands, and has a total budget of 6.3 million euro. The project started in September 2019 and has a duration of four years. Next slide, please. Solon Mias, our project advisor in the European Commission, explains in this slide that our project has a significant policy and marketability potential, and this is why it was funded by the European Commission. Next slide, please. The policy and marketability potential and impact has already been acknowledged by the former EU Commissioner for the Environment, Mr. Carmen Vela, when he selected our predecessor project, Solbrine, as the best out of 4,306 EU projects implemented over the past 25 years. Next slide, please. Now, here you can see the different project actions, with the main groups being the preparatory, implementation, monitoring, public awareness, and management actions. The environmental assessment is taking place within the, within the monitoring actions that you can see on the left, while our main implementation activities comprise, please go to the next slide, a technical demonstration at the Ziemovic coal mine site. It is important to state here that we have already proven at pilot scale that we can reduce the energy requirements by 50% compared to the Debiensko case study. And we will now scale up at this site. Uh, please uh, uh, press click again. Zoe, thanks. Currently, the Ziemovit coal mine is discharging the brine effluent through the Goavietsky River to the Vistula River that we saw earlier in this presentation. This river is classified as a water body under the Water Framework Directive and has already been characterized as having bad ecological status. Next slide, please. With reference to the policy part of our research, you may see quickly at this slide the methodology that, that we have established for developing the first circular economy action plan for the coal mine sector. I'm very happy to announce that today we are releasing our first policy brief related to this work. Get in contact with me if you would like to receive a copy. Go to the next slide, please, Zoe. We are currently making a stakeholder analysis involving different target groups such as coal mine industries, waste incineration sector policy makers, the investor community, etc. Next slide, please. In Poland, we have screened the main stakeholders of the public administration sector, and we are now in the process of identifying who are the key stakeholders. Also, in view of the coal regions in transition initiative and the just transition mechanism, which is the Marshall Office for the region of Slovakia. Next slide, please. And here you can see the first results of our stakeholder evaluation exercises on the basis of which we will organize 
our upcoming stakeholder consultation events within 2021. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Demetrius. That was very interesting, very exciting to hear about this uh, circular economy action plan and it's being released at uh, the policy brief today. So that's very exciting. Um, so, yeah, thank you to all of our panelists. That's kind of closing the presentations now and we'll be uh, opening the Q&A session. And just a reminder that um, uh, submit your questions on Slido. We've already got some good ones that have come in. Um, so we'll be addressing all of those and we've got a good amount of time. So hopefully we'll be able to get to all of them. Um, so I'm just going to start off with a, with a question that we had pre-prepared. So from the perspective of those um, working to develop blueprints and roadmaps for coal mine closures, what would you recommend as a key initial focus points for addressing environmental Im impacts? Where would one um, start? Um, so do any of our panellists um, would like to answer that question? I'm just having trouble. Oh, Pedro, yes, please. Okay. okay, thank you, Zoe. Now, just uh, to answer this question, I just want to say that uh, key initial focus could be planification. Just uh, to close, uh, to properly close uh, uh, underground or open pit coal mine, you have to do it with planification and with several years in advance. This is the the the, the key initial focus. After that, uh, you start studying, see what uh, what is going to happen in the future, but planifications and several years before closing the mines or having some kind of, uh, of preparation is needed. I think this is the most important aspect. Thank you, Alicia. Yes, definitely I would agree with Pedro and especially this long-term view that should be taken in this case. There are some short-term actions, but they are not sufficient. I mean, uh, this should be taken into account and this should be a broad uh, types of, different types of uh, solutions that should be implemented in the same time. This is very important. So planification and, and uh, the vision of this, how the future should look like. So we should start with this point and then look for the solutions uh, that can bring us there. And I think our projects, uh, today's projects, are small uh, steps to do that. Of course, they can be upscaled, but it requires, I'm, I'm sure Dimitris will support me, it requires support. We need that support. And sometimes it's not enough just to have a nice handshake. We need something else. Thank you. Uh, Dimitris, did you have anything to say? For the support that Alicia said, that, that is really, really important. And this is why we need to see which are the stakeholders, that the key stakeholders involved also at the local and regional level. And the just territorial plans pl play a crucial role for that. And we need to join hands, definitely, to see how we can address all these challenges together. Yes, I agree with Alicia for that. Um, thank you, guys. Um, and I think what we'll do now is go to some of the questions from Slido. Um, Lucas, the most popular question is for you, so I'll pass this over to you. Um, so how will the alignment between projects funded under the RFCS and the Just Run mechanism be guaranteed? Okay. Um, well, it will be guaranteed in the sense that uh, uh, when the next call, I mean, when the changes are uh, how do you call it, approved by the council, um, a, a new call will be uh, launched where uh, projects, uh, where, how do you call it, uh, a call will be done for projects that address uh, the uh, just uh, transition mechanism uh, ideas. So um, it will be mentioned in the description of the call. So in that way, it should be, uh, uh, it should be uh, it should be addressed. Brilliant, thank you, um, uh, Alicia. The the next question is for you. Um, for which uses is the, is the artificial soil suitable for um, agriculture? Thank you. <laughs> That's me reading out directly. If that makes sense. Thank you very much for the question. Well, t in <clears throat> this case, when I'm talking about recovery and this project we are doing, of course. As I've mentioned, uh, it, every um, solution 
is made uh, for a specific uh, situation. So in this case, when we were using different wastes and we were analyzing them, we realized that they cannot be used for agriculture use, but they, they were used to uh, get back the new habitats in this region and to, to get the highest value from the point of view that we can do some use this uh, uh, site for new solutions. So we are still exploring exploring the range of uh, different uh, solutions, but it's not going to be agriculture definitely because we are using wastes that are produced in this region. This was really important uh, for us just to, to look at these solutions from the point of view of circular economy. So, so use the waste that the company is producing and in this uh, region and uh, to be uh, in order to produce soils that uh, are suitable to plant uh, new species. So, so no, I'm afraid that no agriculture, but I told you that there are other, um, other partners in the project and uh, conditions in different waste heaps uh, can vary a lot. And then we can just find solutions even for agriculture. Thank you. Thank you um, for that. Um, uh, the next question is from Brian Ricketts from Eurocol. Um, the RFCS modernization package is very welcome. Will carbon based materials be included in future R&D as alternatives to uh, um, carbon intensive uh, ones? Uh, EG still in concrete. Lucas, I think this is for you. Yes, um, there was some uh, delay in the thing, but I hope you can hear me uh, OK. Um, okay, I can, I see nothing. Um, well, um, yes, I think uh, so, but um, of course, uh, the whole idea of the modernization is to um, to address the phasing out of coal. So uh, alternative use of uh, carbon-based uh, projects, which don't lead to CO2 emissions are of, uh, of course very welcome because that would be part of the, uh, of the transition. Um, uh, how exactly it will be uh, put into writing for the next calls that's, uh, that we have to look at. But uh, for steel, uh, of course, there is also the idea to, uh, of the hydrogen steel making. So uh, hydrogen should then be, um, how do you call it, uh, produced with uh, renewables. And uh, from that, uh, uh, in that way, emissions of uh, the steel making process. Um, um, so yes, I mean, uh, uh, R and D will play an important role, but not only in the RFCS uh, uh, package, but also uh, in Horizon Europe. Of course, there uh, will be also opportunities uh, for uh, for research. But I'm not sure if this was what Brian actually meant. So if he wants more. Yeah, Brian, also enter another question. Um, we have got plenty of time to answer everyone's questions. Um, so this is a question for a, uh, our researchers. Um, for rehabilitation, what metrics do you use for measuring and comparing different benefits and values of ecosystem services? Um, uh, well, th I think this question goes to me, yes, uh, and, and also to Pedro, because Pedro is also involved in this project. So we make a cost benefit assessment confronting restoration costs with the monetary value of the ecosystem services provided. Uh, there are really good papers related to this topic um, by Dagmar Hasse. She is a professor at the University in Berlin. So I really recommend uh, reading these papers because she's also a part of our team. And she was the kind of a first point to start this uh, this project because she she wrote good uh, research papers on this topic and that's how everything started. Thank you. Uh, Pedro, do you have anything to add? I think, sorry, I think uh, Alicia yesterday answers perfectly I, there is nothing <laughs> on my point of view no I, to evaluate ecosystem to to obtain a monetary value of ecosystem services services sorry may may may, may seem difficult or may seem the, almost impossible to achieve but as alicia alicia said there are people who have been working in this in this in this area for many years and if you want i can join this question with the one which is presenter 
Justin, uh, uh, on this, which is how did you get into contact with all the partners prior to the project? Okay, for example, for, for this, uh, for the recovery projects, apart from the partners who we usually work with, for example, with the Central Mining Institute in Poland, as we were, we had no experience with um, ecosystem services or with ecosystem services valuation. We just, uh, mm, by means of the world of knowledge, by means of the papers that were published uh, all around the world, but uh, well, of course focusing on Europe, we try to select the the, the best uh, the best uh, partners possible. And in this case, where they were at the um, at Berlin at uh, at Germany, at um, I don't know, I don't, I don't remember exactly the university. Maybe Alicia can help. So because they, they have the best papers published ever, so we we got in contact in contact with them. Uber University, Uber University, no. I don't remember now. Humboldt University in Humboldt Berlin. Humboldt University. Thank you very much, Alicia. And uh, we got in contact with them. We we talked uh, about the plans we have, what we wanted to do, and they said that we will be delighted to join. And uh, and that was the beginning of the of the of the project. And the second question is: Was national co-funding allowed in the research fund for Colonel Steel? National co-funding is always allowed. Uh, usually. The, the companies and the research institu institutions and the university that cooperate, that participate in the project, they have to co-fund the project because a, a research fund for Coral Steel, um, except in the case of accompanying measures in which uh, financing could reach uh, 100% in, in research projects and in pilot projects, 60%, 50% is the biggest uh, uh, share of of funding given by the Research Fund for Coral Steel. Thank you. Thanks, Pedro. I'll pass over to Alicia. Thank you. I, I thank you. I agree with Pedro. And uh, but I would like to mention one thing that, of course, uh, uh, you can find partners, you can find people to work with, but it's always there's always an idea somewhere there, and you have to work hard on this. And I think also. Uh, when we are meeting here uh, in the platform and we are talking about the initiatives, there always has to be somebody who will start and just uh, show the vision, the vision of, of the idea. It can be a small idea, like, uh, like the one that is tackling uh, specific problems, but it can be also a broader vision because uh, Horizon uh, 2020 was dealing with uh, bigger problems on different levels, uh, even the technical levels uh, of uh, technical re uh, readiness levels so so you need uh, good people uh, people with good skills but you need uh, uh, really somebody passionate to work stronger on this and to to get the project I i'm not sure what is the success rate in research fund for plant steel i could ask now uh, lucas maybe can give us these numbers but even it doesn't matter if it's horizon if it's uh, if it's research fund for plant steel there is a strong competition and you have to show that uh, really your idea is good enough to be supported by public money because this is public money. Uh, of course, Pedro mentioned that you need to support, you need to find a part of this money uh, from the industry uh, or, or it can be some other sources. Uh, it also shows that uh, to some extent um, these ideas are good because if the industry is going to support you, means that your idea is good enough to be funded. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, uh, Dimitris, do you have anything to say on this question? Uh, uh, it's it's more related to rehabilitation. This this discussion, but uh, as Alicia said, this is uh, these uh, calls are really competitive. Horizon twenty twenty are normally around eighty percent. So you need to be to have a clear uh, vision, to have very good ideas and have partners on board because they are looking into systemic innovation, not only technical innovation. So social aspects, policy aspects, everything has to be there to make it successful. I guess the same is for them, for this fund that I didn't know because I'm not in this loop for the RFCS, but I guess it's the same. Oh, Lucas. 
Yes. Uh, no, I mean, for RFTS, the um, success rates are a little bit higher. I don't know uh, why, but it depends also very much on uh, the number of, uh, of projects that are submitted. Because uh, uh, last year uh, we had 39, if I'm correct, uh, projects. This year, uh, this year's calls, there were only 34 uh, coal projects uh, submitted. And that makes already an enormous difference, no? Uh, in uh, because normally the amount is uh, the number of project selects is the same, so it goes up and down. But we uh, for coal we have a, about a success rate of about 20 uh, 20 percent uh, now. Uh, for steel, I don't know. I have to look that up. But uh, for coal, I know that it's about 20 percent, uh, and maybe this year a bit higher because we have less uh, uh, submissions. Back to Lisa. Thank you, Lucas, for this insight. The truth is that industry uh, is now uh, has a, a little bit, let's say, not a challenge. It's a challenge because the, the decision was made that uh, projects in research found coal, coal and steel uh, have to be in line with Green Deal. So uh, technically, no pro projects related to development of mining are accepted. So this way, it has to. This is also a very good uh, exercise just to shift your uh, vision and your thinking on all these ideas related to post mining rehabilitation and solutions that can make the regions and support the regions in the transition period so i think this is this is something really good from this perspective but it also it's very challenging for the consortia i mean for for people taking part in this because the, not always the industry is that much interested in these solutions uh, for, for them to, to get a new technical uh, solution for some problem. So this is an, another issue that I think should be mentioned here, that we have a, a very good vision, but being sometimes in line with Green Deal, it's a, a big challenge for the consortium to find the appropriate support. Thank you for both of your responses on that. Um, uh, our next popular question is from Joan, I think. I hope I'm providing that, uh, pronouncing that right. As mining regions transformations are multidimensional, any plans for cross-linking the topic with Horizon, etc., i.e. with a focus more on the humanities? Hmm. Does anyone want to come back on that question? Yeah. Um, Lucas? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, yeah, we, of course, um, uh, RFCS is supposed to be uh, not competing with, uh, with Horizon. It should be uh, um, a different type of uh, issues. But um, um, in the Horizon, I think there are several uh, possibilities where this could be uh, uh, addressed, but that's not yeah, my speciality. So. Uh, you sh they should be looking into the new uh, uh, calls that will be uh, uh, that will be uh, launched uh, in Horizon Europe. Uh, I, uh, I would like to say for us, um, uh, we try uh, we try to yeah to address these issues that are not addressed by by Horizon. Let me put it that way. Maybe something from my end, if I may add, Zoe. By coincidence, today I was speaking with um, the head of, of the unit because it was the World Circular Economy Forum that is happening now, and I participated in that as well. And um, I heard from this group that they are now working in the new work program for 2021-2022. It will be biannual as it was in Horizon uh, 2020 and that uh, most probably it will be published in the coming uh, months, if this helps. Uh, thank you for those insights. Maybe we'll just go back to you, Dimitri, um, this is a question for you. Um, could you share some examples of circular economy practices, practices current or future, linked to mine closures? Uh, thank you very much. Actually, I think that the one that I shared with, uh, with my presentation is the most relevant one. So uh, the Debbie Ensco that started in 1988, it is a reference for that at a global scale. And I have been at that, at that site. It is impressive, the work that they have done. 
meaning that uh, not only did they manage to uh, recover, uh, to treat the wastewater, sorry, but also to recover the salts and in a quality that now is actually being used in the marketplace. So that is really, really important because it needs to get different aspects there to get that to the market from a, from a health perspective, from a chemical um, assurance that you have the right quality to meet this target. So in Poland, that is a, really a success story on how they have achieved this target for the coal mine closure and at the same time, how this affects an active coal mine because in order to get a license to operate, they needed to do that also for the neighboring um, coal mine. And now we are uh, working uh, uh, very hard on how to advance that. And because as I said in my uh, presentation, there, there is high energy consumption and this needs to be uh, addressed also in view of the European Green Deal, because all activities by 2050 needs to de be decarbonized, including, of course, wastewater treatment. And maybe as a final remark, for the deca decarbonization part, we are looking into different possibilities. Um, and we need to see around what is happening, meaning that we do have different sectors that can collaborate and should not be uh, treated as silos. For example, the waste incineration is totally different sector for the sector that we are discussing today. But for us, it is one of the candidates because you can get green energy and combine different activities to have circular economy implemented. Just uh, as a point that we should think about. Back to you, Zoe. Thank you. Um, and now a question for Lucas. Uh, what percentage of co-funding, what is the percentage of co-funding for these projects? Don't you think that the industry should largely co-fund projects to respect uh, the polluters pay, the polluter pays principle? Yes. Uh, well, uh, it was already, I think, mentioned by Pedro. Um, there are uh, three uh, amounts, so it's 100% uh, uh, can be reimbursed, but that's only for accompanying measures. So that is uh, for projects that uh, focus on uh, dissemination of uh, existing um, projects, uh, results of exi existing projects. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, these kind of projects, of, of course, have a very low budget relatively compared to the to the research projects. For research projects, it's uh, sixty percent. And for uh, pilot demonstration projects, it's fifty percent. The lower amount for pilot and demonstration project uh, is, of course, that it has a higher uh, uh, TRL uh, because this is just before things go to the market. So from that point of view, it's logical that uh, uh, companies should, well, uh, should not get everything for free. They, uh, there should be an interest and also commercial uh, uh, interest to, uh, to do this, uh, to do this uh, research. Uh, when they, when you say uh, should actually co-fund projects to respect of the, uh, well, it's not so much the polluters pay project uh, principle uh, in RCS. The more idea is it's an, indus an industri uh, industrial industrial um, uh, program, so uh, it's meant for. Uh, uh, for um, improving uh, uh, product uh, production uh, and uh, products which have um, commercial uh, value. So, uh, in case uh, we finance them, there is a, a, a commercial advantage for the um, uh, the companies that use this uh, this knowledge. So, from that point of view, it's logical that. Uh, industries should co-fund co because they have uh, uh, advantage out of it. Uh, from our point of view, of course, it's important that the European uh, industry is able to compete internationally. So that's why we uh, finance these kinds of, uh, of projects. Thank you um, uh, for shedding some light on that. And um, uh, the next question is from Ricardo. Uh, said, I'm glad the European Commission is looking into renewable H2 for steel production um, for the RFCS. Do you think that the size of the RFCS is enough for funding breakthrough projects? 
<laughs> well, the answer to that is uh, no. <laughs> but um, from that point of view, um, we are trying to uh, work together uh, with this partnership for steel. So uh, uh, RFCS is not the only one, but there will be a broader uh, consortium of also Horizon to work uh, to get more money available for these breakthrough uh, 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 technologies. And that won't be easy. So um, we are looking uh, uh, to get as much uh, um, money available to uh, to uh, to finance these kinds of uh, projects. <clears throat> Thank you, Lucas. Um, and then finally, maybe we can go back to our researchers and kind of broaden this out a little bit. Um, step back. What do you kind of foresee as the major barriers for coal regions, and and how can we work to overcome them in a in a maybe a broader sense? And you ask me. Uh, anyone who wants to uh, come back on that one, um, I'm just checking everyone's camera. Pedro. Well, <clears throat> ah, thank you. So, Zoe. Yes, the main uh, for, in my opinion, only my opinion, uh, the main barrier that I see for coal regions uh, and how to overcome them. The main barrier is the amount of jobs that are going to be lose, lost when coal mine is closed. And this is the main handicap because it is difficult to find uh, any economic activities that may help to, to create a similar or a quite similar amount of jo jobs of the, as the ones that are going to be lost. And how we can work to overcome them? Working hard and uh, trying to find intelligent ideas. But uh, I'm sorry, I do not have the like the magic recipe for this for this question but working hard i imagine back to you so so we uh, uh so then dimitris yes uh, thanks zoe so uh, it is it is important that the real challenge here is that the energy transition is happening so fast and that uh, now the the new law uh, has been already adopted the EU Green Deal is already happening and the 2050 is not that far away. So the, the fast speed is really a challenge. Now, uh, for, from my way of thinking, and since we see that uh, through the lens of circular economy, coal mine regions could um, should at the first place see what other economic activities, as Pedro said, uh, could start, could initiate, and circular economy can do that, meaning that uh, for the moment, coal mine industry is uh, is uh, mining coal, of course. But then, with with the wastewater, what we are contributing is that they can somehow be transformed into salt producers. That is totally disruptive, totally different. But that could be a way forward. They could see how they can use the, the same personnel that has been working for a specific purpose over the past years to transition into into something different. Yes but it can give them some social and just transition for that. So we need such type of disruptive ideas and we need, of course, to see how we can really implement that. Thank you. Alicia, did you have a response as well? Yes, uh, I would agree with both uh, Pedro and Dimitris. Uh, this is a great challenge, first of all, because we are talking about uh, uh, the workers, the mine workers, that they have, they need to find a new job. I'm not talking about the, uh, the ones that will retire. I'm talking about young people who are still involved, engaged in the industry, and we need to help them. But I'm also thinking about uh, what will happen with the uh, next generations behind them, because there are some regions that are with a long history in in mining, and we have, we need to give them solutions. And uh, geographical context really matters. Because uh, some regions, uh, for them, it's easier uh, to go through the solutions that were given by Dimitris. I, I agree fully that some regions can do that. But uh, the others, uh, which are strongly industrial regions, uh, for them, it's much more difficult. So, in my opinion, first of all, we have to work on different issues and find the solutions, uh, the long-term strategy. The long term strategy that would give a hope, let's, I would call it hope or, or ideas, for, for next generations and how the regions will look like, because they are really worried about this. And they want to know if they should think about moving to some other region or they have, uh, there are some ideas that uh, policymakers cannot offer them. 
And this is something that uh, most young people are expecting. Some idea, some policy, some vision that they can just um, stay with and that will not be changed every time the new government appears. I, that's, I can say this, that this is something that it's really difficult. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Lucas, do you have any final thoughts on this? Um, well, I mean, for me, I would say that uh, the biggest uh, um, problem probably for regions is to, to get the information, to get access to the knowledge that they need uh, and um, to know, uh, for example, uh, to have information on, on, uh, about best practices and about uh, um uh, things that worked in some countries and uh, and some regions and things that didn't work in other regions for our fund uh, it's a bit of a problem because uh in order to participate uh, uh one region cannot uh make a project proposal um, um as such because you need to have international cooperation at least two member states should be involved and uh, at least three uh, consortiums should be at least three uh, three organizations or three entities. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, therefore it's a bit difficult for them to uh, participate. But on the other hand, uh, we also have projects like Merida that can be used by the uh, by the regions uh, to learn from. So um, yeah, I, I, I would say uh, most is access to knowledge would be uh, in my view. The main barrier. And um, if I may add, uh, Zoe, okay. to, to what uh, Lucas is saying, because access to knowledge is really, really important. Um, I am a newcomer to this call regions uh, platform, so I was wondering if there is any specific platform or regular meetings that uh, um, could uh, help in sharing best practices and also uh, for the organizations, for the entities that are developing the just territorial plans. Because these are the ones that, uh, for example, will use the just transition mechanism to get the funds. So is there something like that? I don't know who I should address this question to, maybe not you, Zoe, or I don't, I don't know, but that would be interesting for me to know, maybe for the audience as well. Uh, Lucas, do you have anything to come back with on that? Um, um, uh, yes, but well, I mean, uh, I think um, the, uh, this platform uh, probably is one of the best, uh, um, how do you call it, best uh, uh, means or how do you call it, uh, to find that information because uh, we try at least uh, we see this platform as the as the the best way uh, to to uh, disseminate information about our program to the regions uh, i mean the um, the, the companies um, the ones uh, the mining companies and uh, uh, how to call it universities and so on they are normally uh, quite well aware uh, how it works and they know each other, they can form uh, consortia, but for regions it's a bit uh, because they are not uh, they are not used to work in, uh, in in research. So for them, I think uh, this 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 platform uh, would work best. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm just going to uh, echo what Lucas said there. I mean, um, the resources from all of our meetings um, and, and workshops are available online, as I mentioned. Uh, in the introduction and I think you know we we all of the panelists have raised this lack of information as a real barrier to action and hopefully you know this this uh, webinar today is you know taking a step to to helping spread um, the the information from all of the amazing research projects that you guys um, are involved with um, so uh, I think that is all of our questions covered um, so we're finishing a little bit early but it's really great that we managed to cover all of the questions from the audience um, I just want to thank all of our panelists um, for the excellent presentations and really insightful responses to the questions um, uh, and i would like to thank um Akris and everyone who is doing the the technical stuff um you've been great and thank you to all the attendees um it's been great having you and thank you for the really uh, uh, uh the great questions which i think expanded the discussion really well just to round out as i said i think uh 
we've hopefully taken a step to you know spread more of this information that can can uh, help regions um, um, address these environmental impacts um, of of the of the coal transition and and uh, find some actionable insights and, and steps forward um, with a helpful presentation from Lucas and, and answering those questions as well. So um, on that note, I will thank uh, again everyone again, and we will close the session. So thank you everyone, um, and uh, have a great rest of day.